their cells are crying because there's a boo boo, right? These cells that are infected, they secrete chemicals. You call them, what do you call them? Colony stimulating factors. And that, yeah, they're chemicals, they're hormones. Hormones are chemicals. And so, okay, okay. so this is the injured cell or the sick cell. It's sick, it's been infected, so it secretes colony stimulating factors or leukotrienes. They're also called leukotrienes. Anyway, these are the hormones. So these colony stimulating factors, they go, this is the one that, so here in your blood vessel, you will have your white blood cells, see? They're here, but you also have white blood cells already deployed under your skin. Anyway, that's how they know how to go. And the way that they're, so of the three cells, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets, the white blood cells have the, only the white blood cells under normal conditions, only the white blood cells are able to leave your blood vessels. Red blood cells and, and the platelets, if you're normal, they shouldn't be found outside of a blood vessel. They should always be inside blood vessel. Only white blood cells are able to come out. So they're able to squeeze like amoeba. You squeeze out. So through openings of your blood vessel, the name of that blood vessel is the capillary. So they squeeze out, they change shape, they become like this. They're able to squeeze out and they go. They are attracted to these chemicals that's being secreted by the injured cell. And that's called chemotaxis. The way I try to remember, a taxi. They ride a taxi. Uh, attracted to the chemicals secreted there. So chemotaxis, they go there. And then they, can you imagine, lots of them, they congregate to an area of infection. At the same time, so the blood vessel, you know that every part of the body has is, is supplied with blood except for epithelium. We know that epithelium is a vascular. So there's, the, my drawing is so very far from it, but this is, they're really not that far. They don't have to travel that far. At the same time, some of the white blood cells, specifically your basophils, secrete histamine and heparin in response to any kind of infection of, or foreign substance. So the histamine promotes inflammation, the heparin, blood thinning. So even though you have lots of white blood cells uh, congregating in this area, you don't, you don't make the blood thick, possibly clotting it because of the heparin. So they're able to contain the infection. That's how your white blood cells work. Your body, yes, white blood cells, we know that they their function is to fight infection, but they can't do their job unless they're told to. That's the thing about your body. It has to be told. We're studying the function of every part of the body. The heart pumps, the blood vessel supply, the, the muscles contract, etc., etc., etc. Et they have to be told. Okay, they, they, they are told to do their job either by the nervous system. See your muscles, right? We know it contracts, but it has to be told by nerves to contract. Same thing here. We know white blood cells, they fight in, they have to be told. Everything we study, they have to be told to do what they need to do. Do you have any questions on this one? Okay, it's not that hard. And then for, for hemostasis, remember, if there's a cut, there's your blood vessel, right? Oh, oh, we're already in chapter 18. So if there's a cut, it makes sense. The way you try to analyze what's going on if I have a boo-boo, you think about the blood vessel first. It gets irritated. So, and you know that blood vessels, there's a, the wall is made, part of the wall contains smooth muscle. So the first thing that happens, it will contract called spasm, vasospasm. So when it when it contracts like that, you see that the diameter or the opening becomes smaller. 
So that's what happens. This part here, the small, the smooth muscle contracts. So you see, it becomes smaller now. The opening, and when it becomes smaller like that, there's an advantage. You're decreasing the chance for blood to leave, and also you're increasing the chance for the platelets to be called. And you remember the platelets have a very nice smooth shape like this, but once they encounter any roughness, and that's what happens when there's a break in the blood vessel wall, the collagen fibers, part of the connective tissue that makes up the wall of your blood vessel, they get exposed. So the fibers get exposed like split ends. And then the platelets, once one platelet gets stripped right like that, the platelet changes shape. It becomes spiky. And all you need is one platelet to be spiky. All the other platelets will be activated. This is positive feedback mechanism. So before you know it, you have a platelet plug. At the same time, while this platelet, see how they talk. While this platelet plug is being formed, the platelets secrete what you call platelet factor. In the book, anytime you see the word factor, factor is actually a hormone. The reason why they write factor instead of hormone is because scientists are still debating whether it's an actual hormone or no, not really actual hormone, but they're still debating on the actual composition of that chemical. They argue. It's mostly protein when someone says it's mostly lipid. So so that they or or while they're still trying to come up with an agreement as to the actual configuration, they give it the term factor. But it functions as hormone. See, they talk. So the platelets, this this activated platelets, as they make the blood, it's amazing. They secrete these platelet factors. What is the platelet factor doing? This platelet factor is now activating what you call the complement. Not complement. The glutting proteins. Glutting proteins. And so this, I know you know this one, the factor 8, factor 9. Factor 10, right? Hemophilia is a problem with clotting. So that's what happens. These clotting proteins, I said, do you do you understand? It's just review from last week. Does it make sense, my drawing? Mm -hmm. Sorry about my drawing, okay? But in your blood, you always have clotting proteins. They are nothing but proteins. They're meant to clot, but they are inactive. So I have this. This is inactive. They're just flowing smoothly, no problem. All of a sudden, if they see that communication, see the platelets, the activated platelets, stop. They call them. The word they use is called platelet factor. So when the clotting proteins see that, when they hear the platelet factor, that's how they talk, right? So then this becomes activated and it's a cascade. If you see your, your uh, pathway, right? The, it's like you activate clotting protein number 8 and then 9 and then 10. And then the, the result is I wanted you to remember prothrombin, which is another protein that is always present in your blood. This is the inactive form. Okay, so I'm going to go back to this cascade. The result of activating your cascade or uh, your clotting pathway is you convert this prothrombin to thrombin. This is where you get the word thrombus or thrombosis. And then there is another protein, remember, fibrinogen. We talked about that as one of the proteins in blood, fibrinogen. So this is another inactive protein in your blood. This thrombin 
what this does is it serves as an enzyme to convert fibrinogen to fibrin. So this is the actual clot. Now you have a very effective clot and the blood stops bleeding. The bleeding stops. Do you have any questions on this one? What do you call blood that has uh, clotted? It's called serum. Remember, that's the difference between plasma and serum. Once this fibrinogen has been fibrin, we cannot call it plasma. It's now serum. Do you understand this pathway? So this is what you call coagulation, okay? This is different from agglutination. Coagulation means blood clotting. Agglutination is clumping. And that's what happens when you uh, transfuse mismatched blood, right? The wrong blood type. I don't think I need to review blood typing with you. You you got the blood typing part, right? Okay. So today we start with the heart. And then we're going to do a lab on the blood. I'm going to ask you to identify specific white blood cells. Okay. And you can use your book. I just want you to focus the first specific white blood cell I'm going to tell you and you call me when you have focused on the white blood cell. Don't worry, don't panic. You have lots of nice pictures here, pictures in your book too. I just want you to be able to show me, okay? And that will help you also because the blood worksheet you're supposed to draw, right? Okay. I'm sure you know how a red blood cell looks like. Do you all know how a red blood cell looks like? So, in the test, or if in case I ask you, you know how to identify red blood cell, white blood cell, and the white are uh, the platelets, they look like specks of dirt. If the pointer, or if I am pointing to the blank space, what is that? That is plasma, very good, okay? If I ask you, what is the most abundant component of the plasma? It is water water right plasma is 96 percent water and this is why we worry about the unsaturated fats you see look at your blood everything we take your vitamins your the food that we take in everything the hormones where are they in the blood they are in the plasma so the the blood is just made up of two parts right the plasma and this, the cells, because they have a form, you call them formed elements. So everything that we ingest, it's here in the plasma. And because the plasma is mainly water, it is making sense now that if we take or eat the, the unsaturated, the fat is the main problem because fat is insoluble in water. So that's why we have to worry about that. Watch for the fat in your diet. Okay, now we talk about the heart. The heart we know is the pumping organ. It supports you. So we're going to do a few things today. You're going to open up your heart. Not your heart, but you're going to dissect the heart and identify the parts of the heart, the structures, if there's time, okay? And then in addition, you're going to do the blood, identify blood slides. If we don't have time for the heart, we're going to open up our heart on Wednesday. But today, I want you to do the blood slides. So here, if the heart, write down in your notes. It's very important for you to know. I'm going to go to this slide over here. It is very important for us to appreciate that the cardiovascular system is a closed circuit, closed. So that's why it's able to maintain pressure, right? But because it's a closed circuit, and do you agree when I tell you your 
body tissues, the way they get nourished, they must have gotten their nourishment from the blood, right? That means the blood, this blood vessels, there must be blood vessels that have openings or pores to allow the exit of substances that's in the blood. You agree, right? That's how you get nourishment. That's how your muscles get their nutrients. The sugar is able to escape. How the sugar and the different nutrients escape, they go out with water. You agree or do you follow? If they go out with water, look at, and this is a closed circuit, you have to bring it back in here, right? Everything that left here, mainly water, the water has to go back here because what did you write down? The cardiovascular system is a closed circuit. That's very important for us to remember. And that's why we are able to measure blood pressure. It's closed, doesn't go anywhere. So the pressure is lifting. If it's a one way or open circuit, you can't measure blood pressure, okay? So here is your heart. Um, there's the functions. I think, I thought this was very, very interesting. Can you imagine this one? Every day, your heart beats about 100,000 times or about 35 million beats a year. That's amazing. And your heart never stops beating the moment it is born. Okay? So let's look at first the anatomy of the heart, where it's located. Look at where it's located. You know that, the, what cavity is this one? Thoracic. And look at this thoracic cavity. It, the heart, and look for this in the cat, okay? Here is very important for you to visually uh, look at the heart, its relation to the lungs and all of these structures in your cat. So look at, it shares the thoracic cavity with what organ? Mm -hmm. The lungs. And they're very close, aren't they? You see it in your cat. They're very close. But if you have a lung problem or lung infection, it is not automatic that your heart will also be infected. You agree? Same with the heart, right? If you have a heart problem, it's not automatic that your lungs will be affected, even though they're touching. They're so close to one another. And the here comes the importance of the covering. Yes. The heart is found in the thoracic cavity, but it has its own bedroom, like you, we have our own bedrooms, right? And its own bedroom is locked inside a space. This is called pericardial cavity. And this one, occupied by the lungs only, is called pleural cavity. So this is pericardial cavity. And this is pleural cavity. And their bedroom or their cavity is enclosed by a membrane. So here in the heart, it's called pericardium. That's the membrane that covers your heart. In your lungs, it's called pleura. I think that's why you call it pleural cavity. So they have their own, and in fact, the membrane is double-layered membrane. See? So because it's locked in, it has, it's really surrounded by a membrane. Even though you have a problem here, it's not going to be shared with this one very, very easily. No, they have their own space. But let's look at that pericardium. So one thing, what is the main tissue type of the heart? It is mainly, yes, very good. It's mainly muscle, very good. Okay, so remember that. Where's my paper down? Okay, and now this, and the pericardium, when you open the cat heart, Look at that pericardium. 
The pericardium is not loose around the heart. The pericardium really uh, follows the shape or the contours of the heart. There is, it's not a loose fitting membrane. It's just tight. Okay? So like some people like to wear tight fitting. The leggings, leggings, right? It's tight. There's no, it's not a baggy, what do you call it? The sweatpants, it's not baggy like that, right? It's like leggings, okay? So have you heard of pericarditis, right? Some people can suffer pericarditis. Pericarditis is a, an idiopathic problem. There's a lot of times it follows chemotherapy or radiation treatment, but no one really, there's no actual cause for pericarditis. It's just that some people are prone to that one. When there's pericarditis, any, anything that ends in ITIS means inflammation, right? So between the, so there's two layers of pericardium. Uh, the inner layer is always called visceral. So please note this because we'll, there's, we're go talking about the internal organs now. The internal organs are always covered by membrane. And usually, the membranes are made up of two layers. The inner is always called visceral, and the outer is always called parietal. Okay? So it's the same here. There's a visceral pericardium and a parietal pericardium. And in between the two, there's a space, and that space is filled with fluid. The fluid is called pericardial fluid. That fluid is very important. And it makes sense. What do you think is the function of the pericardial fluid? Yes, very good, right? The heart pumps and beats to, um, for pain-free beating of the heart. And that's what the fluid does. But remember, this is like legging. So imagine... Your leggings, you're wearing two layers of leggings, same thing here. If this gets swollen, if you have pericarditis, there's because of the inflammation, there's increased fluid that's being formed here. Do you think that's dangerous for them? Yes, right? Look at your heart, No prob the heart contracts, no problem with muscle contraction, very easy, right? But if there's fluid here, the problem is, if there's fluid, more and more and more fluid, it, yeah, it's hard for the heart to open up. It gets suffocated. It's easy to do this. It's easy to beat. But to relax, it gets suffocated. That's why pericarditis is an emergency. You have to uh, release the fluid. You have to help this heart, prevent it from getting suffocated. There's two parts to the to the beating or two phases to the heart activity. When it's contracting, you call that systole. So systole is contraction of the heart. Diastole, relaxation of the heart. Diastole. So when you have pericarditis, which of the two events is compromised? Diastole, right? Systole, no problem. Systole is just like this. So the pericarditis, the fluid there, is not going to be affected. But it's the relaxation. It's, it's going to be hard to open up because there's resistance now. There's increased swelling there. That's the same thing when you have a pneumothorax. Okay? It's the opening up that's going to be affected. Okay? Okay. Now, I want, what is this one? This is your, that, very good. That's your diaphragm. And the diaphragm helps us to, yes, to breathe. Okay? You know that the diaphragm contracts up and down, up and down, so you can breathe. And we always tell you, you're going to work in the ER and one of the things that we encourage post-operative patients is to do deep breathing exercises. And then you, they ask you why, and you always tell them, so that your heart will be healthy. Now, and then they may ask you why. What's the, what's the, 
what has breathing got to do with the heart? Anatomically, you can explain it to them and look for that in your cat, okay? So if you look at this pericardium, notice, notice in your cat how the pericardium fuses with the connective tissue that makes up your diaphragm. So it fuses, you see that? It fuses like that so that when this, when you go, when you do deep breathing, don't you think that that's also going to help the heart? Because the pericardium and the diaphragm, it fuses with the connective tissue there. You understand? So that's why you tell your patients, do deep breathing. It will help your heart for the health of your heart. Okay? That is the reason. Maybe I'll ask you that in the test. I don't know. Okay? Okay, so now, and now let's look at, again, looking at the heart, the pericardium, and here's the thoracic cavity, okay? So yes, the thoracic cavity is big, yes, this one, but you know that the bones, do the bones expand? No, they don't, right? Once they're formed, they're formed. They stay like that. You can just maybe thicken the bones, but they don't. They cannot expand. You cannot expand this cavity any further, okay? And this one, you cannot expand your pericardial cavity also. So this is one of the things that you will tell your patients, especially hypertensive people who are not very good with taking their medication, their blood pressure medication. What What is the most common problem with uh, what do you mean by hypertension? Increased blood pressure, right? When there is increased blood pressure, it must be because there is increased resistance in the output. So the heart, when it pumps, it's pumping blood into this big blood vessel, the aorta. But you compare the amount of blood here to the diameter of the aorta, you know that the aorta is getting a lot of blood. So this one has to expand to accommodate all of that blood. Do you understand? So people with hypertension, sometimes this blood vessel, the aorta, has hardened. If it has hardened, it's not able to expand, accommodate all of that blood, right? That's one problem with the high blood pressure people. Or another problem is there is maybe a plaque here. Whatever the reason for the blood pressure, there is increased resistance here. So that what happens to the heart? The heart has to pump harder, right? Has to pump harder to overcome the resistance so that it can push all of the blood that it just received. That's what the heart does. It's supposed to pump all of the blood. If there is any resistance here, it has to pump harder. Do you understand? That's when you have increased resistance, you are hypertensive. So what do you give them? You give them a, a, a medication that lowers their blood pressure. If they have cholesterol problems, you give them cholesterol medication. Because why? You want to help the heart. Why do you want to help the heart? Because this is muscle, right? And what happens when we exercise again? After a while you exercise, you get sexy. You bulk up, right? Don't you bulk up? Don't you think that the heart, so when we exercise, it's called resistance exercise, right? Isn't this also increased resistance for the heart? So predict what will happen to the heart if that resistance remains uncorrected. Correct, the heart will enlarge. But is there any space, room for growth of the heart? No. So what will happen? Let's look at the inside of the heart. This is the scary part. Look at, this is, okay. I'm going to, there, there, look at. the. And you're going to open up your own hearts. You see it. So I know there's no room for expansion like that. We agree that, right? 
We cannot expand the heart like that because the pericardium limits that. So what will happen? The heart is made up of my, it will still thicken. Yes, ma'am, it could. See, it will thicken that way so that the space inside, the cavity inside gets smaller. So when it gets smaller, can it receive the blood? No, it's going to have difficulty. So eventually, these hypertensive patients, if they don't take care of themselves, they have, they feel they're drowning. Right? Congestive heart failure. Very good. Now you understand these terms. Why do you call it congestive? It is congested. Like you have a congestion here in your nose. There's a congestion going on here. So the heart eventually will. So if this is only accepting a limited amount, so where is there a backlog? Up down here in your veins. We're going to talk about the blood vessels. So you see them with swollen blood vessels. You see them. Sometimes you even see, even regularly you see like, whoa. You can see it bounding in the neck. Don't you see? Why? Because it's trying to get into the heart. It can't. See? That's what happens. That's why... We want to make sure to explain to them. If the, the pericardium was more accommodating, maybe we won't have a problem like that. But it's not. It's limited by that pericardium. So we want to tell them, really, really take your medication, your blood pressure medication. The heart will suffer. Okay? So let's open up the heart. Here, the heart is a port. Oh, before we do that, let's. There's a few things I want you to know about the heart. What are the things I want? Okay. I'll just remind you, okay? Number one, write down in your notes. Autorhythmicity. What this means is the heart beats on its own. Autorhythmicity. Meaning the heart does not require or does not depend on your nervous system the way we think of the nervous system. It does not need the nervous system to set its fundamental beating. The heart has what you call the pacemaker. Have you heard of pacemaker? Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. So the pacemaker is the internal nervous system of the heart. That's why it's autorhythmic. You have a stroke, take away all the nervous supply, or even do a heart transplant, you harvest that heart, you have to ice it down so it will stop beating. It beats on its own. So this pacemaker, beginning with the SA node, the AV node, this AV bundle, then right and left, then you have your Perkin G fibers. When you look at this under the microscope, they are cardiac muscle fibers but they are a special type of cardiac muscle fibers. They don't contract. They function as nerves. You understand? So that's why there's a true or false statement in the final exam, I remember. The heart does not, the fundamental rhythm of the heart does not rely on the nervous system. That's true. When does the nervous system and the endocrine system come into play? When you maybe you increase your, but the, the basic, basic fundamental rhythm of the heart is not affected by the nervous system. But let's say you're exercising or you're getting nervous or any kind of, of problems. You're, you have a sympathetic problem or whatever. Now you feel your heart beating faster. So when it, oh, the normal rate is because of your pacemaker. Anything above or below normal is because of your nervous system and your endocrine system. 
let's say there's a lot of, or, or you're dehydrated. Remember, we talked about the endocrine system. When you're dehydrated, you have ADH being secreted, antidiuretic hormone to absorb the fluid. You must also have your sympathetic nervous system acting, right? You Do you agree? When you're losing blood, sympathetic nervous system indeed increases the heart rate. So it must also increase the beating, the contraction of the heart. So that's when it comes into play. When you have to adjust, to adapt to anything above the normal, okay? Number two, right now, fatigue resistance. Do you agree? It must be fatigue resistant. You can tell your heart at night, okay, good night, go to bed. You can tell your heart that the moment it started beating. The only time it will stop is when you're dead, right? But as long as you're alive, it cannot. It can't get tired. See? When it gets tired, heart failure, you want to help it. If you don't help the patient, the patient will die. So it's not picky as far as it's nutrient. Whatever you have in your blood, it will use. But it has one. It has its favorite. Like your brain, what's the favorite nutrient of your brain? It is? Yes, very good. It's sugar. It's glucose, isn't it? For the heart, it's fat. The heart prefers fat. Because the heart prefers fat, you see? We have to make sure that we have the good fat in our, stored in our adipose. Because why? It's beyond your control. You have hormones. They're constantly going to be released into the blood because what? Your heart prefers fat. The fat is always present in your blood as long as you have adipose. So what do I have stored in my adipose? Is it the donut fat? Joe, we have the donut fat stored in your adipose, right? Or is it the good fat? See? We gotta think about that, right? Okay. Number three, I want you to remember your coronary circulation, remember? So remember we talked about the blood supply to the heart, the oxygen uh, demand of the heart. Remember, we talked about that last week, how your red blood cells, the hemoglobin, each hemoglobin molecule binds <coughs> four oxygen molecules, right? So as far as the systemic circulation is concerned, or the blood supply to the rest of your body, when you see the word deoxyhemoglobin, right? How many oxygen molecules are unloaded for systemic? It's just out of the four oxygen molecules in each oxygen, uh, in each hemoglobin, how many of them are unloaded in your system? Just one, very good it's still 75% saturated. But how many in the heart? Three, very good. <coughs> so each time the coronary circuit, so I know that the heart pumps blood, but the heart is also made up of cells and they also need nutrients. That's how the fat gets there. But it also requires oxygen. And each time the blood is being supplied to nourish my heart cells, it's unloading three oxygen molecules each time. So you see which organ, in other words, which organ in the body suffers from oxygen deprivation first? The heart. And now you understand, like I said, now you understand when you work in the ER, patient comes in, pulse ox, it's down to 90, you hook EKG, right? You immediately, you put that oxygen because you worry about the heart. It requires, it has a higher demand for oxygen compared to the rest of the body, okay? Okay. So now let's, you want to be able to identify the different parts of the heart. One more thing. One more last thing, okay? So here is your heart. It's made up of cardiac muscle fibers. I want to review, I want 
I, I hope you remember how the, the excitation contraction coupling, you remember the process I had you, uh, uh, what do you call, arranged in chronological order. Do you remember when the muscle is stimulated to contract? Remember? When the muscle is stimulated by the nerve to contract, remember that sarcoplasmic reticulum? Remember how calcium is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum? You remember that? And there's your actin and myosin. It's the same thing with cardiac muscle, right? You have actin and myosin. And so when this muscle is stimulated to contract, the calcium is released, remember? And then the calcium triggers that excitation contraction coupling. No, the sliding filament mechanism. There's one very important difference for cardiac muscle compared to skeletal and smooth muscle. With cardiac muscle, don't forget this. When the, this cardiac muscle is stimulated to contract, the result is the entry of calcium. One more time. The pacemaker, when it stimulates this muscle, the result is this muscle allows entry of calcium, extracellular calcium. So the entry of that extracellular calcium is actually the trigger for the calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum to be released in the cytoplasm. You see, this is called calcium-induced calcium release. Calcium-induced calcium release. One more time. My heart is stimulated to contract. The result of stimulation of cardiac muscle is, number one, entry of extracellular calcium. It is the extracellular calcium that triggers the release of the calcium that's locked up in my sarcoplasmic reticulum. From there, all the events are the same with skeletal muscle. And that's why if you ever work in the ER and you look at the crash card, you'll see there one of the contents of the crash card is called calcium gluconate injection. And if a patient comes in in cardiac arrest, you will see sometimes they inject that calcium gluconate directly into the heart of the patient. And the patient may be revived, may contract again. You understand what this means, everybody? Calcium induced calcium release. One more time, when the heart muscle is excited, what results? Entry of X. So there should, do you remember we talked about homeostasis of calcium? Now you understand why you have so much 401k of calcium in your bone. We needed the calcium for neurotransmitter release in the nervous system but now you see how calcium is so important for your heart to be you see that's why at the expense of the health of your bones you cannot afford to have abnormal calcium levels in your blood you have to have it within normal all the time because it's the extracellular calcium that's the key for the calcium here in the sarcoplasmic reticulum to be released. Okay? That's the one big difference. Then after that, everything is the same. <coughs> okay? So that's why I'm sure you heard of calcium channel blockers, right? For some patients. Now you understand why they give those drugs. Okay? So... Let's look at the internal anatomy now. We know that the heart is a four-chambered organ right here. I'm going to ask you towards the end, maybe towards maybe the last two weeks of class, I'm going to ask you to draw. I'll show you what I mean. <coughs> Something like this. I'm going to ask you to draw 
can <clears throat> write the story, connect the dots, okay? So this is very nice drawing. It, it doesn't have to be this lines, with it, but I just, at towards the end, I wanted to connect the dots and write a little love story, what's going on, okay? And so be sure you, you'll be able to do this one towards the end. It's not hard. This is just my way of finding out whether you really understood the concepts of human anatomy and physiology or not. Okay. And everything is linked by the cardiovascular system. Everything. Okay. So here's the, the heart. You break it and you see the four chambers. So two superior chambers called atrium, two inferior chambers called ventricles. How I try to remember the letter A, it points up, so it's a superior chamber. This is like your roof and it drains, right? And then the ventricles, the letter B, it points down, so these are my inferior chambers. The atrium are my receiving chambers, and that's why you want to remember that it drains on the atrium, so they only receive the rain. And then the ventricles have to pump it. So the ventricles are referred to as your pumping chambers or discharging chambers. Okay? The atrium just receives. And you have right and left. There is this part right here that separates it. It's called a septum. <laughs> so the interatrial septum will separate the right from the left atrium and the interventricular septum separates the right from the left ventricle. Don't, you don't need to write all these terms, okay? It's in your book. Don't worry about it. Don't stress too much. Okay, now, uh, by the way, this septum, if you look at this one, this is made up of cardiac muscle also. It just separates it. And you know that the superior atria is separated from the inferior ventricles by these valves. I want you to appreciate these valves in your cat. The heart valves, it's top, it's top connective tissue. That's the same as ours. The reason why I want you to appreciate this is because when we get to the blood vessels, I want you to compare these valves with the vein valves. It's so different. This is strong. Okay, and I'm sure you know, what is the function of valves? Correct, very good. It's, it's to prevent the backflow, to promote, to make sure that the blood flows one way. It goes forward, no backflow, right? You want to do, so there are two circuits. The right side of the heart delivers the blood that it receives. It's going to deliver it to your lungs. To pick up oxygen. The left side of the heart is going to deliver the blood to the rest of the body because it's already picked up oxygen. So the right side is referred to as the pulmonary circuit and the left side is your systemic circuit. So the right side is receiving deoxygenated blood. And then what 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 age you will ah what age? What, what chamber will receive it? The atrium. So the right atrium is receiving deoxygenated blood. So right now I want you to know the, the blood vessels. The main, you know that there are three blood vessels, veins, arteries, and capillaries. Veins, you see this one, in they return the blood back into the heart. Arteries, they use this letter A, A for away. They deliver blood away from the heart. And then the capillaries are the only blood vessels that have pores. These are your exchange vessels. Please remember this. I will ask in the test. Where do you think white blood cells, where do they leave the circulation? Capillaries. How about your sugar? 
your enzymes, your hormones, how do they always capillary? They cannot be here on, because this vein, this artery, has no openings or pores. Only capillaries have pores. You understand? So we're gonna we're going to study this in more detail, but for now you need to know them. This too, very important. Here's your veins, your big veins. So veins, when you open up your heart, the sheep heart, I'm going to ask you to open up one sheep heart, and then you look at the cat heart. The cat heart is smaller. So that's when you look at the sheep heart. The cat heart is more for appreciating its relation to the lungs and the pericardium, how it fuses with the diaphragm. So with the sheep heart, I wanted to use the probe, the probe. And how do I know what, what opening is this one or what vessel is this one? So I wanted to use a probe. And if that vessel is opening into an atrium, you know that your, this vessel is a vein because veins empty into the heart. Then you use another probe, let's say through the ventricle. And through the ventricle, you push, push, push. What opening is that? That must be an artery because arteries deliver blood away from the heart. Your ventricle discharges blood. So ventricle, the opening from a ventricle is an artery. The opening into an atrium is a vein because the, the atrium receives. That's how you're able to know what type of blood vessel that is. So take advantage of your probe when you op open up your heart. Look, I know this is the right side and this is the left side. The right side, even though the heart, both sides receive the same amount of blood. The right side is the pulmonary circuit, right? So the right side delivers blood to where? To the? Yes, very good. How far is the lungs from the heart? Not too far, right? They're neighbors. The left side has to deliver blood where? All the way, yes, to your pinky toes. How far is your pinky toes? It's so far. So which one has to work harder? So look at, I know this is left. It's thicker, has thicker muscle. It has to work harder. That's how you're able to differentiate, right? So you, you're going to be required to cut the heart. I think that, that was a question asked in your test. How do you know just by looking at your heart which one is right and which one is left? So you just say the right is thinner. Because always uh, when I ask for questions, you I hope you know by now I want you to answer, what do you call it? Answer completely, right? You just don't say, because the right is thinner. I want you to always tell me why. The right is thinner because it only pumps to the heart. So it doesn't have to work as hard as the left. You see? Okay. Now, let's look at this valves. The, this is called, there are two valves here. Do you agree? Because the job of the heart is to prevent backflow. There are valves between the atria and ventricles. And there are also valves between the arteries and the ventricles, not the vein. Because the veins just deliver blood back in there, okay? So you will find valves between the A and B, atria and ventricles, and between the ventricles to the uh, arteries, deliver blood away. So here, you call them AV valves, or if you... Remember, on the right, it's called tricuspid valve. This is the right AV valve. The left AV valve is called the mitral valve. I know you're familiar with that. Very common, mitral valve prolapse, right? And then in your, to your arteries, this one is called pulmonary valve. They're semilunar, so you say pulmonary semilunar valve. To the aorta is called aortic valve or aortic semilunar valve. Okay, so here tricuspid, here mitral valve. So we said that this one, the job of your valves is to prevent the backflow. 
So when do you think the valve should close? During systole or diastole? During, look at, syst when is the heart receiving blood? During systole or diastole? Diastole. So during diastole, is the valve open or closed? It should open, right? So when should the valve close? During systole or diastole? Systole, very good. Okay, now I want you to look at this. This is what the, the strings, look at that in your cat. It's the same for us, okay? This is what you call chordae tendine because it resembles the chords of the guitar. So this is also top connective tissue. And you see where it's anchored? To the muscle of your heart. This is the, papi uh, the papillary muscles of the heart. Don't worry too much about terms. I prefer that you understand. In the summer, uh, it's just, it's short week. I prefer, not short week, but short quarter. I, I want you to really understand. Yes. So would you want to know? What's called the AV valve on the left, the mitral valve, or the bicuspid? What? Oh, bicuspid. Whatever you want. Okay. Whatever. Okay. Or if you forget, what? Where is the mitral valve? I can even remind you. That's the left. Okay. So I think what's more common it, when you start practicing is tricuspid and mitral valve. Maybe that will help you now to your benefit to remember. Right? Is tricuspid left is my valve, okay? So you see this four day tendine? You said that the job of the ventricles, I'm sorry, the, the job of the AV valves is to prevent the backflow. And the backflow is will happen during systole, right? During, when this contracts, the heart contracts because it wants to deliver the blood from here to the aorta or the pulmonary artery, aorta or pulmonary artery. On the right side, the heart will deliver that blood to the pulmonary artery. On the left side, the heart will deliver the blood to the aorta. So those are the two arteries. So this one then, this the blood that the ventricle just received, when it contracts, it's not supposed to go back to the aorta, to the atrium, but go out to the big arteries. And so that's the job of these AV valves. When this contracts, this should close. This chordate tendine is very important for you to appreciate because if you have weak chordate tendine or ruptured chordate tendine, this one can then swing up and the blood just goes up and down, up and down, not to the aorta. It's very important for you to appreciate. Who has ever had a sore throat? I have. Did you ever always have your sore throat checked? Each and every time, did you ever have it checked? Each and every time? No, right? Sometimes we think, oh, it's just a sore throat. Today I'm better. So you keep going, you keep going. Who knows? What if that was a strep throat? Maybe you were healthy enough to and prevent that strep throat from really uh, making you weak, but it was still strep throat. That's the thing about strep throat. Its favorite residence is right here. So they, they are here, and then before you know it, there's more and more and more and more of them. Then they can break that or make it weak so that eventually when you get older, when you're weaker, because you, you got strep throat when you, you were young, but you didn't have it checked. They're there now. The strep throat, the favorite residence of the strep throat in the body is here and in your kidneys. I don't know why, but that's their favorite. So with here, they weaken this one. Can you predict what will happen? Go back up. That's called prolapse. You heard of prolapse? So when so people <coughs> who have a ruptured or weakened chordae tendine, this valve is not able to do its job anymore. There will be prolapsing. So when there is prolapsing, there will be mixing, right, of this blood that's trying to come in here. You just mix. They're not going anywhere. So can you predict the symptoms or complaints of your patients with prolapse? I'm thinking 
lack energy, right? Get tired. See, they may pass out. That's because they're not pumping. So then the rest of the body is not getting enough oxygenated blood. Would their uh, breathing increase? Yes, their breathing will try to increase because they're they're just yeah they're they're tired. So a lot of times people think oh maybe lung problem, but a lot of but when you when there's easy fatigability tiredness always think heart. Does that also cause uh, hypertension? Yes, hypertension it can. Congestion, right? There can be congestion. Hypotension? Oh, because it's not pumping enough blood. Yes. You can develop pulmonary hypertension because it's going back to the lungs instead of being delivered. You can also develop hypotension. Does it make sense? You're not pumping enough to the heart. I uh, sorry, to the systemic. There's a backlog. So where, remember, there's two parts. The left side pumps to the rest of the body. The right side pumps to the lungs. So, and then there, this is the one that's returning the blood. So you will have pulmonary congestion, hypertension, pulmonary. And then here, you can have low blood pressure because it's not pumping enough blood. It's, yes. Would you have an increased CO2 in your body? CO2, yes. Because it's a backlog. That's why you have to be fast. Yes. Okay. So that's why we we should appreciate our vows. It's amazing the study of the heart, right? We need to appreciate our vows. So I want you to be able to trace. You, I want you to bleed the blood and be able to trace the flow. So here, right here be able to trace the flow of blood. So the journal blood square inferior vena cava to the right atrium to the right AV valve. Okay? So be sure you know your anatomy. Okay. One more thing about the heart before we study the physiology. Right here, the fibrous skeleton. So you remember, uh, I'm going to go back to the a B valve. So what they're showing here, these are nothing but the valves. The valves. So I'm going to go back to the nice picture that shows the valves right here. See? So these valves, this is connective tissue. You know that the heart is suspended. We know that muscle is attached to bones, right? The skeleton, but there's no skeleton that attaches to the heart. There is connective tissue. That's why it's called fibrous skeleton. So this serves as a point of anchor for your heart. But to me, the very important function of the fibrous skeleton is this one. So point of insertion, structural foundation. But this number three is the very important function of the, heart, of the fibrous skeleton of the heart, as far as I'm concerned for me. Okay, so what makes up the fibrous skeleton? This connective tissue, beginning with the valves right here. So it makes a fibrous skeleton. And these valves function as electrical insulator. What do you mean by electrical insulator? This valves slows down the conduction or the propagation of action potential. Remember that the heart is made up of muscle. When it gets stimulated, it will contract. Then you stimulate the ventricles, it will contract. Question, do you think it will work for the heart for both atria and ventricles to contract at the same time? No, right? You want the atria to contract first, Wait for the ventricle to be filled, then contract. Contract, contract. So when this is contracting, this is open. When this contracts, this is open. So there is this electrical insulator, the fibrous skeleton, which is made up of what? This AV valves to slow down. 
the conduction so that there is enough time. You see? There, the, remember the heart, when we talked about cardiac muscle, remember the, the intercalated discs, the, the gap junctions there, how the pacemaker just fires so fast so that the heart, it beats like one big cell. But this effectively slows down. It's like a hurdle. So, yes, the pacemaker is going to fire fast, but when it gets to this part, the connective tissue here, there's, it's not muscle, so it slows down. It has to jump over the connective tissue before it resumes the conduction here. And that, that insulation right here is very effective. It slows down. So that you stimulate the atria, then it beats or it contracts. In the meantime, this is still relaxed because there was a slowing down here. So when this gets stimulated and it contracts, it's already filled with blood. You understand? Okay. So there are two parts to the study of the heart then. You see that there's the pacemaker, right? And you see that the heart, so the heart beats on its own called chronotropic. chronotropic property of the heart and the cro you understand the chronograph the watch okay so there's two parts to the study of the heart it's beating because it beats on its own the autorhythmicity so that part the autorhythmic property of the heart is referred to as chronotropic and then we also know that the heart is muscle. So we're also going to study the inotropic property of the heart. So a healthy heart, in other words, have two components, a chronotropic component, and the, meaning the beating, and the inotropic, meaning pumping. So that's why if you have cardiac patients, usually they won't have just one drug. They'll have several drugs, at least two. One is to correct the chronotropic or help the chronotropic property. What is this one? The heart rate. In other, this is your heart rate. And this one is how strong your heart pumps each beating. This one heart rate, this one pumping. So the calcium channel blockers, if you have patients on calcium channel blockers, this is what it's being helped for the heart. Then you have some patients on beta blockers. That's what it's treating, the chronotropic part of the heart. Okay, so let's have a break for five minutes, then we'll continue.